the cricket spent its entire life in church, what would it know about the world? Do you think crickets or similar insects get together in church sometimes during the week and have their own little prayer meeting? And they think about the universe and they're looking up and they're saying, yes, it's a great big sky that we live under. God must really be big. (laughs) Thank you. God must really be big to create a building this size and a ceiling so high. But what would you know about those crickets as they're doing their philosophical activity? What would you know? You would know that they are speaking from very limited experience. Crickets really cannot know. Bugs in church cannot know anything besides the building that they have always lived in. And in many ways, human beings are like those insects. We, too, know nothing more about our experience from what we can understand but what we experience. I didn't know what a cowrie tree was like until yesterday. I could guess, give it some thought, compare it with sequoia trees in California, for example, which I have visited before. But there's nothing like being there and experiencing something. And that means that when it comes to talking about God, human beings have serious limitations. It should teach us a couple of things. First of all, humility. You could have five PhDs, have gone to every major university, and you would still know very little about God. You would still know very little about the universe. You would still know very little about New Zealand, the United States, Africa, or any other place. We all have limited experience. And that means, first of all, that we all have a lot to learn. And if we all have a lot to learn, then humility is a good starting place. It also means that we can all learn from each other. Because your experience is not the same as mine. Some of you may have grown up in a cowrie forest, for all I know. And I'm sure there are many things that you have learned in your experience that you could teach me. So we need each other. But there's something further here in this text that we're studying this morning for Sabbath school. How many of you have heard of postmodernism? Can I see your hands? Does that term mean anything? It means something to a few of you. Well, postmodernism is the conviction that many philosophers and thinking people have come to recently that the world has undergone a large shift in the way people approach truth. In the scientific age, so-called modernism, people believed that truth was out there. That if you and I did careful research, did the appropriate experiments, talked to the right people, etc., we could come to truth. Of course, one of those scientific truths is that the world came into existence through evolution. And the problem with the scientific worldview is you can get overconfident about what you know. And there were a lot of people in the world that were confident in science and didn't need God. Now, postmodernism is a new philosophical development, particularly affecting the youth in this country as well as many others. You could say it this way. If a New Zealander is under 30, they are postmodernists. If a New Zealander is over 60, you're a modernist. If you're between 30 and 60 like me, you're confused. (laughs) You're not quite sure who you are or where you're coming from. In other words, if you're my age, everything that you grew up so confident in seems like it's falling apart, doesn't it? 
Things are not, you know, they're, they're just not going the way, that, the good old days, you see. Now, if you're over 60, you can just say, well, my way is the right way, and it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And that's okay. Up to a point. <laughs> If you're under 30, though, you're probably wondering, what do those people in church think is going on? Don't they realize that the world's a-changing? And you can't just do things the way you used to do them? We're facing a major shift. Some of it is very good. Because postmodernism tells us that science has limited perception. Is that true? It's very true, isn't it? Postmodernism tells us that nobody has the whole picture. We're all like crickets in a church building to some degree. The sad thing about postmodernism is that many people become convinced that if no one can truly grasp the whole picture, then we don't really know anything worth knowing. And that can be depressing and very discouraging. To a world like today, the Gospel of John sends the prologue, the first 18 verses. And you know what it tells us? It tells us that the architect of the church decided that the crickets in the church were of such high value that he would become a cricket in order to help the crickets break out of the box that they lived in and in their minds grasp something of eternal things. You see, postmodernism is right. Science was too confident that it could understand the universe. And much of what science believed 50 years ago isn't true anymore. If you know anything about quantum physics, you will know that all the nice little certainties in science aren't there anymore. I once played golf with a quantum physicist. And I asked him, tell me everything I need to know about quantum physics in two minutes or less. And after laughing for more than two minutes, <laughs> he then told me something like this. Well, quantum physics tells us that a single object can be in two different places at the same time, that two different objects can occupy the same space at the same time. And if you're studying a subatomic particle in the United States, it affects your studying of it affects the movement of subatomic particles in New Zealand. Now, none of that sounds anything like science that I learned growing up. But we've learned more, and we've come to realize that what we've learned is so, so small and so, so little. To a world like this, the Gospel of John comes and says that the one who made the world... The one who knows everything there is to know came down and became a human being and lived among us. And while the Bible doesn't tell us everything that there is to know, the Bible tells us those things that are most necessary to know. And one of those things is that we do have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ, or as the author of the Gospel puts it, He is the Word. God's final word. That's what Jesus is and Jesus was. So that's what this gospel of John is all about. And even in today's world where people question how much you can know truth, we have a message to say, but if God comes down, then we can know truth, even though scientifically we may not grasp it. Now, as we open up the gospel, and I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 1. We'll just read a few verses here, just to get the flavor of it. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And I'm going to be giving you an opportunity to participate. I don't believe in teaching Sabbath school without some participation, at least. And in a group this size, that can be difficult. But we do have a roving mic and uh, in a little bit, I'm going to ask a leading question or two, inviting you to respond to it, uh, several of you to respond to each of those, and uh, be prepared to uh, come down toward the front and, uh, so that everyone can hear you when that time comes. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, it probably doesn't take a Greek scholar to figure out that what I just read was poetry. Did, did you get the feel of that? I, it happens I read the uh, New American Standard Bible. I have uh, four translations here. It's my wife's, by the way. And she graciously let me use that this morning uh, so that I could... Uh, Look at the different translations from time to time. But I think no matter what translation you have, there's a poetry to John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. There's a flow that comes through in this particular text. Now let me ask a question, and, and you don't need to come down for this. You could just holler out the answer, just a word or, or a short phrase. Where would early Christians have heard poetry? In the Psalms, okay? In the Old Testament, you have Psalms, all poetry. By the way, Hebrew poetry is different from English poetry. English poetry works by rhyme. You sort of bring the sentence to the end with the same kind of sound, and it has a ring to it, a certain rhythm and a rhyme. Well, Hebrew poetry is different. It also has a rhythm, like English poetry, but instead of rhyming the words, there's a rhyming of ideas. Let's see. Um, the heavens... Well, let me, I'm trying to think of one. Uh, boy, your mind goes blank at the best times. Let's see. All right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Do you see the poetry there? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So understanding and wisdom, they go together. You see that? What goes together on this side of the sentence? Fear of the Lord and knowledge of the Holy One. So what does it mean to fear God? To know Him. To have a relationship with Him is to fear God. So it's not fear in the usual sense of the English word. Oh, no. No, it's fear in the sense of respect and admire somebody you know well. All right? So this poetry in the Psalms, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, Job, most of the prophets are poetry. When God speaks in the Bible, he always talks in poetry. I should say almost always, because scholars always cover their tracks. But if I'm not mistaken... Every time God speaks in the Bible, it's poetry. Isn't that something? Our God is a lover of beauty. He's a lover of art and literary beauty. That's, that's an amazing thing. So one place that early Christians would run into poetry is hearing the Old Testament read in church. What would the other possibility be? Any idea? What? At home? Perhaps? Singing. Do we know that early Christians sang songs? There's at least three or four places in the New Testament that tells us to sing songs. And hymns and, and spiritual psalms and so forth, all right? Early Christians sang songs. And songs are in poetry. Just a possibility. You don't have to buy this if you don't want to. I suspect one possibility in the Gospel of John is that when John was writing the introduction to his Gospel, he chose an early Christian hymn for the wording with which to introduce his Gospel. That he modified an early Christian hymn that they would have known and sung in the churches and understood and used that to introduce his Gospel. I, I can't guarantee it. But there's poetry here, and there's very little poetry in the New Testament. 
So if you have poetry here, you have to ask, why did John use poetry here? Nowhere else in the gospel, but right here is poetry. Suspicion. Perhaps John is connecting with early Christian hymns. He's connecting some with the Old Testament as well in this passage. Not only that, he uses an interesting name for Jesus. And the name in the Greek is Logos. In the beginning was the Logos, the Word of God. Now when he calls Jesus the Word of God, he's not describing the fact that Jesus was a speaker. He's describing something about Jesus himself. Jesus in his person is the Logos. Now here's the interesting thing. Early Christians would have been familiar with this term. Where would they have learned it? From the Old Testament? No. Because nowhere in the Old Testament is Logos, the word, used of a person. God could speak. And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they'd use the words that are rooted in Logos. God spoke and things happened. He commanded. They stood fast. All right. The Old Testament can use the word as spoken word, but it never uses it as a title of a person. What's interesting is the Greek philosophical world was full of the Logos. Because you see, there was God in the Greek mind, and God was way up there and really, really great. And then there's the earth down here. It's way down here and really dirty and yucky. That was the Greek philosophical idea. It's that God is so pure and so great that he would never come down here and mess with this earth. So you know what the Greek philosophers came up with? The Logos, the Word, as an intermediate God who would be a mediator between the great God and earth. And the Logos was the one who created the world, who sustains the world, keeps us all going, keeps the world spinning, keeps the atmosphere going, you see? So within the Greek world, this idea of the Logos was already widespread when Jesus came. So what was John doing? Why would John use poetry, perhaps an early Christian hymn, and Greek philosophical ideas right at the beginning of this gospel? Why would he do that? I'd like to suggest a reason. If we had more time, I'd love to hear from you. I'd like to suggest a reason. God meets people where they are. Whenever God chooses to communicate with people, he meets them where they are. Sounds a little like global mission, doesn't it? If there are people in a part of the world that haven't heard the gospel, they're not likely to hear it if you're sitting in this tent mumbling to yourself. Right? Reminds me of the time I talked to President Clinton about, what was that gal's name, Monica? Well, I was actually driving in my car past the Hoosier Dome. It's a big stadium where Clinton was giving an address. And I told him, I don't think he heard me, but I told him, you see, that doesn't work too well, does it? If you want to reach people, you've got to go where they are. But more than that, you have to go how they are. You can't just go where they are. You have to go how they are. You have to become one of them. You have to be part of the culture. You have to understand their language, the way that they think, the way that they experience life, the way that they look for God. And what God did in Scripture is meet people where they are. He spoke Hebrew when the people spoke Hebrew. He spoke Greek when the people spoke Greek. He spoke to them about philosophical ideas that they were talking about on the street. He met them where they are. Have you ever wondered why there are four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you really need four Gospels to tell the Gospel story? No. One would do. The gospel is the gospel. But apparently, there's more than one right way to tell the gospel story. Apparently, 
No writer, not even an inspired writer, can tell the whole picture of Jesus. So there are four Gospels in the Bible. And no matter who you are or where you're from, one of those Gospels is likely to connect with you in a way that the others do not. Gospel of John happens to be my favorite. Surprise, huh? Let's see. So I spent a lot of time with it. My favorite. But if your favorite is Matthew or Mark, that's fine. God meets people where they are. It's okay to like Matthew better than John, if you do. God meets people where they are. And we see this incredibly illustrated in this prologue to the Gospel of John, where he uses poetry, where he uses some Greek philosophical ideas, where he uses early Christian hymns to connect with a variety of audiences so that each of them would connect with this Gospel and say, this was written for me. Now, if you studied your lesson last week, what was the primary audience of this Gospel? Anybody remember? Above all else, what audience was John writing to? The second generation. I thought I heard somebody going, I think you were talking to me. The second generation of Christians. You see, John was the last living representative of the 12 disciples. The rest had died off. And there was only one person left who had touched Jesus, who had spoken with him, who had heard his words. Only one person left. Everybody else who was out there had only heard about Jesus through somebody else. And now the rumor's going out that John will never die. He'll live till Jesus comes. What would happen to the church if John had died in the face of that rumor? And so a gospel is written. And the goal of this gospel is to provide Jesus for a generation that had never met him, never heard him, spoke to him, touched him, seen him. Are you and I part of that generation? Yes, that's why perhaps the Gospel of John is most people's favorite. Because of the four Gospels, the Gospel of John is the only one written specifically to the second generation of Christians. Those who had never seen, heard, or touched Jesus in the flesh. The Gospel of John is written so that you might believe. Good for Thomas. He saw me, he believed. He touched me, He believed, good for him, but blessed, said Jesus, is the one who has not seen and yet believed. That was the message of last week's lesson. And now we see how God uses the prologue through John to describe in some wonderful ways how to reach people where they are. All right, what does it tell us about Jesus now? Let's come to Jesus himself. Who Jesus is. Who is Jesus in the Gospel of John? He is God. All right, now here I'm going to give you a question. I'd like to hear from you on this question. Most Gospel writers began with what story? The birth of Jesus. The Gospel of John begins with creation. Why? Come on down. Somebody would... Here, we've got a microphone right here. Just come on down. Why do you think the Gospel of John begins with creation rather than with the birth stories of Jesus? Now, I'll encourage you. There's no right answer or wrong answer here. We just want to think about this together. We, we, we have one here as soon as you're done with that. Okay, why don't you just come down. Ooh, it's hard to... Make it maybe to the aisle. Yes, sir. I think it's because John wanted to establish that Jesus Christ himself is God. The other gospel writers, they emphasized the humanity of Christ. Excellent answer. Excellent. All right, we have someone over here. If we could maybe pass that right down to the center here, the very center, right over here. No, you next to Yeah. And then uh, while, while you're passing this microphone on, go ahead, brother. Uh, yes, uh, Pastor, because Jesus is, uh, is an ultimate and eternal. Uh, he is beyond creation. That's why he was God. Yeah. So a special message of John is to show that Jesus is beyond this yes. creation. Okay, yeah. Yeah. excellent. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, because the text of John says that in the beginning was the word, so Jesus was already there because he was the one who created 
Okay. Let there be light. So he's wanting to make clear, keep that microphone steady if you would. Yeah, he yeah. wants to make clear then that Jesus is what? Because he was the creator. Uh -huh. So he was there because he was in the beginning. Was the he world. was there even before the creation. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the one. All right, and that message might not come through in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Anyone else want to share a thought? Why would the Gospel of John begin with creation rather than with the birth of Jesus? I believe that um, the reason why he started with the creation, that the Pharisees, the Jews, and everyone did not accept Christ as the Messiah, where they all believed in creation. So establishing who the Creator was and creation established who Christ was. Excellent. You like that one? Yeah, very, very helpful. So it seems that if you were to treat the Gospels as a biography, then they're simply telling the story of a human being who is born, lives, does some things, and dies. Okay? But the Gospel of John wants to go further. Here we have another. Go ahead. Just, uh, an just another perspective of God, really. It gives you a bigger picture all over. It just comes from a different perspective. All right. So John wants to give a bigger picture. He may be familiar with the other Gospels, but now there's going to be more than you would get from the other Gospels. Excellent. Let me throw another question to add to that, and still uh, feel free to come forward and share. The question is then, if perhaps the Gospel of John wants to make clear this is not simply a biography, we are dealing with God here. The one who came to this earth is the architect. He's the one who made everything. And you could read through the Gospel of John elsewhere and miss that. But once you've read the beginning, you realize this Jesus that you see through the Gospels is huge. The question I want to ask you is why does that matter? Why does divinity of Jesus matter? Why do Christian churches divide over whether Jesus is fully God or half God or a created being? You know, churches have fought wars over this stuff. Why is it important that Jesus be fully God? Anyone want to give a perspective for us? Yes, sir. Because Jesus lived before eternity. Because he lived before eternity. Why does that matter to us? Good, good observation. Why does it matter to us that Jesus lived before eternity? Okay, here and then here. Yes. Um, because everything comes together with Jesus. Uh, without him, there's no purpose in our lives, perhaps, because he started everything. Ah. So if Jesus is fully God, then there's got to be a purpose to everything that wouldn't be there if, if there was no control over the universe. Good. Excellent thought. Yes. One, here, one here, Doug. Okay. In the Gospel of John, he just looked at the resurrection, uh, the resurrection, and then he looks at the claim that who Jesus is, the Son of God. And that's what John is different from the others. Because uh, leading up to the resurrection, Jesus, you know, rise again. And then um, to prove that he is the Son of God, John is um, expect from the others. Okay, by tying Jesus with creation, it helps to prove that he's the Son of God. Excellent. Is there, is there yet one? One here? Yes, over here. There's a sister, I think, that's been waiting a bit. Yeah. Is there one here too? All right, we'll have two more. One on the side. I, I think why is it important because... Three. For the Christian to know, is that right, sir? Yes. Why is it important for Jesus um, to know is for them to, to know that God loves them. God, Jesus is God. Hey, he is the creator. But he, he came to show us that God does care and love us, and that's why he's coming down to them to our level so because he love us so much thank you so the, the loving actions of jesus are now seen to be the loving actions of god where we know about god excellent we have one here and one here yes why why we should know that uh, jesus is god because here we clear a clear picture, two clear pictures that uh, Jesus has demonstrated here. 
uh, is a divinity. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And uh, he lived as a human being, just like he born as a baby of Bethlehem. So that what, uh, that's what uh, make us as a Christian to know that he born as the flesh, so that he dwells amongst us. And that's why he is God, and he's up there in heaven. Uh, he's our high priest right now. He's pleading for the Father, so that we can uh, know that he is a God. He's right in a God, Father, in the right hand of God. Thank you. Amen. That's it. All right. One over here, and if, if you don't mind, we'll take just one more here. But we do have to draw this to a close. So I, I don't want to take too much time from the Sabbath speaker. Yeah. He, Go ahead. He is establishing that God is the creator of the universe, and then he's bringing it down to the fact that God came and dwelt with us. He's establishing the word mm -hmm. as an intermediary between heaven and earth. Amen. That's very, very good. Thank you. Last, last word. Last word. The gospel of John starts from heaven. In the beginning, Jesus was there. The most of the, uh, the three other gospels start from genealogy and the birth of Jesus Christ. The reason of Jesus Christ came down because of his to show, to pay our sins. And show the righteousness of God. We can't wipe off the law. Because the law stayed there. And Jesus went through the law. So we make, the, we come to the salvation because of trusting and faithful to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, two reasons to pay the sins. What's the other reason I just finished all? To show the righteousness of Jesus, of God. We never wipe off the law. The law stayed there eternally. So we faithful, we can't keep the law all the time, but we faithful to Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ came. To keep the law, the, the wages of the law is death. And that's why Jesus came, to keep the law perfectly. So we were faithful to him to go through in heaven. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right. Now I get my final word, and I'll have to be brief. Let me just share with you a thought that uh, is related to a couple of the ones that were said, but uh, let me share something very special to me. I believe that Jesus as God is extremely important because it tells us the value of a human soul. If Jesus were simply a human being and died for me, that would make me very valuable. Somebody was willing to die for me. I feel valued. But if the person who died for me was the one who made the entire universe, how much value do I have now? More value than Michael Jordan? More value than Bill Gates and his $50 billion? More value than the entire world? Value of the entire universe was spilled out for me. And that's the foundation of value for my life. If I am that valued, then I don't need to get in a big snit just because my wife looked at me the wrong way. Or because my best friend didn't feel like spending time with me today. Or because somebody I trusted spoke behind my back. You follow me? When we don't feel valued, those kind of events can destroy us. And we become angry, spiteful people. But when we realize the value that we have in God's eyes, that he would send the creator of the universe to die just for me, then I realize the stuff that happens in this world isn't that important anymore. That I have value that no one can take away. And now I can spend my life giving and loving and doing acts of kindness because I'm filled to overflowing with the value I have in Jesus Christ. That's the reason that in the last part of the prologue, he tells us that Jesus is better than the sanctuary. Could anything be better than the temple to a Jew? Only one thing, the glory of God inside that temple. Jesus, if he is God, is better than the temple. He's better than John the Baptist, the greatest of the prophets. He's better than Moses, the one that gave the whole system of belief that came through Moses. The purpose of this prologue is to say that a human being 
who walked on this earth was the most important person in the universe. And that that person came to this earth for crickets like you and me. And I think I'll spend eternity trying to figure out how to get amazed enough at what God has done.